are we the smartest kid on the block? Is there intelligent life that is more intelligent than we are? And my, my guess is probably yes, because uh, if you open recipe books, you see that out of the same ingredients, you can make very different cakes. So imagine the early earth and its soup of chemicals. What's the chance that this soup of chemicals was put together to make life as we know it in the optimal way so that uh, we are the best possible cake? The chance is quite small if, if that happened by random processes. And it's quite possible that on other planets you have better outcomes, cakes that taste much better. But without a prejudice, without guessing the answer, we should be open-minded and search. And the search can start in our backyard. In other words, looking for objects that came to the solar system from outside. That saves us the trip. We don't need to go to the street. If there are objects from the street that enter into our backyard, we can just look at our backyard. And that saves us the time that it takes to traverse that, that distance. Uh, so it turns out that the, in, in October 19th, 2017, uh, the PANSTARS telescope in Maui, Hawaii, discovered the first interstellar object, the first object that was spotted near Earth and originated from outside the solar system. And we knew that because it was moving too fast to be bound to the sun. In this image, you can see the object circled in blue. And uh, around it are uh, sequences of dots, which are uh, snapshots of stars. And the stars are moving relative to the object. In fact, the object is moving relative to the stars in the sky. But if you focus your eyes on the, on the object, you see the stars as uh, a, a trail of uh, dots. And then that's all the, as a result of the uh, snapshots that were tracking the motion. And uh, this illustrates how Oumuamua moved uh, along its trajectory. And it started in the upper right corner. And uh, if there is any amateur astronomer among you, uh, you would notice that in purple it says solar apex, close to the place where Oumuamua came from. I should say this object was called Oumuamua because it means scout in the Hawaiian language and the telescope was in Hawaii. Now, what is the solar apex? That's the direction towards which the sun is moving in the so-called local standard of rest. The local standard of rest is the frame that you get to when you average over the random motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. So it's sort of like the local galactic uh, public parking lot. Uh, it's the place that is the average of the motions of all the stars and it represents the local standard of rest. And it turns out that this object was at rest in the local standard of rest. Only one in 500 stars is so much at rest in that frame. So it's quite surprising because if this object is the first interstellar object, and we indeed uh, assume that most interstellar objects are ripped apart from the Oort clouds of their parent stars, they should in inherit the motion of their parent stars because they are very loosely bound in the outer parts of the Oort cloud and they basically move at a relatively small speed relative to the um, parent star. So they will, in when they are ripped apart, they will inherit uh, the, the motion of the star. And it's very unlikely to find the first object at rest in the local standard of rest, but that's what happened. Uh, it was like a buoy uh, on the surface of the ocean and the solar system was like a giant ship that bumped into it and kicked it. Now that's the first weird property of this object. Why was it in such a rare configuration? And then this is the trajectory that the object made. So the relative speed is simply the motion of the sun uh, relative to the local standard of rest. This object was standing still in that frame. 
and the sun kicked it by the gravitational force in some other direction. The other strange property is this brightness variation of the object. So we couldn't resolve it because it was too small uh, relative to its distance. So our telescopes could not resolve its internal structure. They could not get a photograph of it, an image. But we could monitor how much light is reflected from it, how much starlight, sunlight. And um, that amount of light varied by a factor bigger than 10 as the object was tumbling over eight hours. And what that means is that projected on the sky, the area of the object, which tells you how much light should be reflected, uh, changed by a factor of 10. So that it's 10 times longer than it is wide projected on the sky. And imagine a piece of paper tumbling in the wind, even if it's razor thin, the chance that it will be exactly edge on is very small. So a factor of 10 is quite extreme. And in fact, we've never seen something like that among solar system asteroids or comets. And the best fit to the light curve was that of a pancake shaped object at the 90% confidence, not cigar shaped, the way it was depicted in a famous uh, cartoon. C the cigar shape is what is projected on the sky, but the intrinsic shape is most likely pancake, flat. And this is a trajectory of this object starting in the top uh, in July. Uh, you can see the dates uh, and then ending. Uh, the discovery was October 19th. So that's uh, on the left of the trajectory. Um, and it, it so happened that uh, in July 2017, I was visiting uh, Mount Haleakala, uh, where the Pan-STARRS telescope is in Maui. We were on vacation with my family and I was asked to give uh, a colloquium at the observatory. Uh, but back then we didn't know that uh, Oumuamua exists. And if we were, if Pan-STARRS were to discover it in July 2017, then we would monitor it on its approach towards us rather than finding it when it was already running away from us uh, faster than any rocket we can, we can send. So it's sort of like seeing a, a, a guest and noticing that the guest is interesting only when the guest leaves through the front door into the dark street, which is a little unfortunate. Um, because in principle, if we were to find an object like that on its uh, approach to us, we can place a camera along its orbit that we can forecast and uh, take a close-up photo. And a picture is worth a thousand words. I wouldn't need to write my book if we had a photograph. It would be obvious what this object is, what the nature of it is. So, the lesson for the future, when we notice another object of this type that looks weird in a few years time, we should monitor it and hopefully we can catch it uh, as it approaches us and take a close up photo. Because Oumuamua was weird on many counts. First of all, we shouldn't have discovered it. Uh, I wrote a paper a decade earlier the first paper forecasting how many objects should be in interstellar space of that size. And based on what we know in the solar system, the forecast was that Panstas would see nothing. And the existence of Oumuamua implies that the number of such objects must be larger than expected by somewhere between a factor of um, 100 to 100 million, a very large factor. So the mere detection of this object is surprising. And of course, as I mentioned, it also had other surprising properties. It came from the local standard of rest, which is one in 500 chance if you associate an object with a star. Uh, and then the brightness changed by more than a factor of 10, implying that it has an extreme shape, most likely flat. Uh, and there was no heat detected from it. Uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope tried to detect infrared radiation uh, and there was nothing. And we can 
predict the temperature on the surface of this object because that temperature depends only on the distance from the sun. So we know how hot it got. And the fact that we haven't detected any emission from it, any heat, implies that it must be smaller than about 200 meters. And given that size limit, we can then infer that its reflectance might, must be substantial because otherwise we wouldn't see the light, the reflected sunlight that we see. So if it's smaller than a certain size, the reflectance needs to be bigger than some, some value. And it turns out that this value is on the high end of um, the reflectance of objects we see usually in the solar system. So if it were as small as 20 meters, then it needed to have reflectance of 100%. All, all of the light falling on it should have, just like in a mirror. Uh, but the most unusual property of this uh, object was that it deviated from an orbit shaped just by the sun's gravity. And there was an extra push away from the sun. And uh, if this push originated from a cometary tail, then you needed about 10% of the mass of the object to evaporate. But we haven't seen any cometary tail around this object. Not only that we didn't see anything, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply around this object and couldn't detect any traces of carbon-based molecules or dust. And clearly that ruled out completely the possibility that it's a conventional comet. It cannot be by many orders of magnitude. Couldn't have been propelled by cometary evaporation of the type that we are familiar with. So then what gave it this extra push? The only thing that I could think of is the reflection of sunlight, just like in the case of a, of a light say. So we wrote a paper in which we suggested perhaps it's a very thin object. But nature doesn't produce light sails. That implies that it might be of artificial origin. And just like we are developing a technology of light sails, perhaps other cultures out there in space have mastered this technology already. Now, the mainstream astronomy community was not happy with the artificial origin, so a few people paid attention to the details. I should say the mainstream community divides into three parts. The, there are people that uh, are bloggers or uh, write uh, popular science books, but they haven't published a single scientific paper over the past decade. These people are well known to the public, but I'm not interested in what, what they say because they haven't really been practicing science. They're guided mostly by the number of likes they get on Twitter. There is the second part, which is most of the scientific community that is not really familiar with the details and just says, ah, it's probably a rock, forget about it, business as usual. And then there is the, there is the group of uh, scientists that really pay attention to the anomalies and try to explain them from a natural origin. And those are the ones that I respect and pay great attention to. And they came up with scenarios for explaining the peculiar properties of Oumuamua. So what did they come up with? One suggestion was it's a very porous object, something like a dust bunny that you find at home, a collection of dust particles that are loosely bound to each other. And this cloud of dust needs to have a density, a mean density mass per unit volume that is a hundred times less than the density of air. So just think about it, uh, if you have a boiling pot of uh, water that you get some steam, but this object should have on average a hundred times less of the density of the steam that you get out of a boiling pot of water. Uh, and the question is, you know, if you have an object roughly the size of a football field, uh, uh, 100, 200 meters um, made of, um, porous material that is a hundred times less dense than air and tumbling over eight hours. Could that kind of an object survive the journey over millions of years? I doubt it. Especially when it's heated by the sun to hundreds of degrees. Then there was a suggestion, maybe these are fragments 
maybe Oumuamua is one of a population of fragments that uh, are produced when a large object is being shredded by the tidal gravitational field near a star, when, when it passes close to a star. The problem with that is usually you get elongated fragments uh, that would look like a cigar, but you don't get pancake-shaped fragments. Also, the chance of passing close to a star is quite small. So most of the objects that you see will not be the relics of passage near a star. And then there was a suggestion, maybe it's molecular hydrogen iceberg, frozen hydrogen, so that when it evaporates, you wouldn't see the cometary tail because it's transparent. The problem with that, we showed in a follow-up paper, is that hydrogen can be evaporated very quickly. So it will definitely not survive the journey. And you can see the common denominator of all these suggestions, all these proposals is that it's something that we have never seen before. So my point is, if the best efforts of the mainstream community to explain the properties of this object and involve something that we have not seen before, why not contemplate an artificial origin? Uh, this is an excerpt from one of the first reviews on my book uh, that appeared in Goodreads. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand a couple of words in this sentence, so I asked my daughters and they explained it to me. But uh, another way to think about Oumuamua is um, that if you go to the beach, uh, you most, most of the time you find the, those uh, naturally produced uh, seashells and rocks. But every now and then you encounter a plastic bottle. And that may be Oumuamua. It's a relic, a technological relic, that implies that there is a civilization out there. It may not be functional anymore, because if it traveled through interstellar space for billions of years, think about Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons. Uh, in a billion years, they will not be functional. They will be just space trash, space junk, just like plastic bottles on the beach. So you sit on the beach and suddenly you see a plastic bottle near your feet. That simply represents a certain uh, number of bottles per unit area on the surface of the ocean and your chance of seeing them depends just on that number. It's very different from the Drake equation that uh, is used to characterize detecting radio signals. For a radio signal, uh, you need, uh, it's just like a phone call. Uh, when you have a conversation on the phone, you need the counterpart to be alive at the time that you have the conversation. But if you are waiting for a letter in the mail, especially if the mail service is very slow, you might receive the letter long after the person who sent it died. So in principle, these plastic bottles accumulate over time and most of them represent dead civilizations, civilizations that are not around anymore. That's a great advantage because you sum over time. And looking for relics is just like doing archaeology. You know, we cannot have a phone, phone conversation with the Mayan culture. They are not around anymore, but we can find the relics in archaeological digs. Now, it turns out there was another object that they exhibited an extra push away from the sun without a cometary tail. It was given the name 2020 SO. It was discovered in September 2020, just a few months ago. And then uh, the astronomers that discovered it on Pan Stars, again, the same telescope, they realized that it actually is a rocket booster from 1966. Based on its orbit, they could figure out that it came from Earth. And uh, therefore, uh, since it's a rocket booster, it's hollow, it's very thin. So uh, the reflection of sunlight can push it significantly. And that demonstrates that we can tell the difference between a thin object and a rock. In this case, we know it's artificial. And by the way, this is the orbit of this object around the Earth, not around the Sun. We know it's artificial, but in the case of Oumuamua, we don't know who produced it. There was another interstellar object, uh, the second one discovered in 2019, called Borisov, after the amateur Russian amateur astronomer Gennady Borisov, 
who discovered it. Um, and uh, this one looked just like a comet. It was very similar to the comets we see in the solar system. So people came to me and said, well, this one is clearly natural. So doesn't it convince you that Oumuamua was also natural? To which I replied, you know, if I find a plastic bottle on the beach and after that I find lots of rocks, that doesn't make the plastic bottle a rock. Or another way to put it, when I met my wife on the first date, I thought that she is special and unique. I met a lot of people after that and it didn't change my opinion about my wife. So in fact, you can reverse the argument and say, given that Borisov looks natural, Oumuamua is even more weird. And the fundamental question is, was its origin natural or artificial? In both cases, it's something that we have never seen before. So we will learn something new if we were to explore similar objects of the same class. My colleagues are saying, oh no, it's a rock. We don't need to pay special attention. My point is, we definitely need to pay special attention to objects of this type because we will learn something new. When you find anomalies, it's nature's way of telling you you're not thinking correctly. And I remember a seminar at Harvard uh, about Oumuamua. And at the end of the seminar, I left the room with a colleague of mine that work, who worked on uh, rocks for decades. And he said, Oumuamua is so weird. I wish it never existed. That was appalling to me because whenever we see anomalies, it's actually an opportunity to learn something new. And that's the fun in doing science. The way I see science is a continuation of my childhood curiosity. Um, I actually enjoy the most these moments where we do not quite know how to interpret what we see because that allows us an opportunity to revise our notions. And our technology came to exist only over the past century. And if you look at the cosmic history, the timeline that is depicted in this illustration, starting from the Big Bang on the left, you know, our technological civilization uh, appeared only in the last bit of cosmic history, which is one part in a hundred million of the age of the universe. And in fact, the sun is a relative latecomer. Um, most of the stars in the universe formed before the sun. So it's quite likely that there were a lot of civilizations like us uh, billions of years ago. They predated us and they left trash in space. We can look for them. And of course, around every star, there is a region where um, life as we know it can originate. It's called the habitable zone. And it depends on the surface temperature of the star. But if you find planets in that zone, you can search for technological signatures. And those include, for example, industrial pollution in the atmospheres of planets around other stars. Or swarms of satellites, which you can trace when the planet passes in front of the star. Or photovoltaic cells on the day side that would reflect the starlight differently than rock and potentially harvest the light in order to generate electricity. You can also look for artificial lights on the night side of the planet. So there are many ways by which we can identify a technological civilization, even after it's dead. Uh, in principle, one can launch light sails near the speed of light without a laser beam, just using a natural source of light. So imagine a massive star about to explode as a supernova. If you park light sails around it at a distance that is roughly a hundred times the Earth-Sun separation, then when the star explodes, it generates a flash of light. And this flash of light that is natural in origin, 
could accelerate those light sails close to the speed of light. Just like surfers on the beaches of Hawaii, they wait for a giant wave to carry them. In this case, it's a wave associated with a flash of light. It's the light that pushes the light sails. And uh, viewing it from a distance would uh, resemble viewing dandelion seeds that are carried by the wind. But uh, these light sails, once they are launched, could fill up the Milky Way galaxy. So Enrico Fermi, a very famous uh, physicist, about 70 years ago, during lunch at Los Alamos, asked the following question. He said, well, it's quite possible there are civilizations out there, but uh, where is everybody? Why don't we see them? To me, this question is, shows arrogance. Um, I remember when I dated my wife uh, early on, uh, she had a lot of friends that were waiting for Prince Charming on a white horse to come and make them a marriage proposal. And that never came. And why would we feel that we are sufficiently interesting, sufficiently intelligent, sufficiently unique for someone to pay us a visit? Uh, I think that we are more likely just ants on a sidewalk. We are very common out there. And when you walk down the street, you don't pay special respect to every ant. Another possible explanation is um, technological civilizations are short-lived. We know that we produce the means for our own destruction with our technologies. And therefore, there is a very short window of opportunity to interact with them. And most of the civilizations we will find will be dead. There is another possibility that I thought about because of the pandemic. You can imagine social distancing on a cosmic scale where very advanced civilizations close themselves off in a cocoon. They have everything they need. They don't need to interact with anyone else because that would lower their standard of living. But that doesn't mean that we cannot find information about them because according to the second law of thermodynamics, they have to deposit some trash. And just like those uh, investigative journalists that uh, search through the trash cans of celebrities in Hollywood to find out about their private lives, we can check those objects that they throw out and figure out something about their existence. But as I mentioned in my book, the most likely explanation is that civilizations are short-lived. And then we can do space archaeology, find plastic bottles like uh, Oumuamua or artifacts of dead civilizations on other planets, like big structures, polluted atmospheres, and so forth. My hope is if we find relics of civilizations that perish as a result of climate change or wars, that would inspire us to get our act together and avoid a similar fate so we can learn from their history. Moreover, if we see advanced technologies out there, perhaps we can copy them and use them on Earth. It would feel like cheating in an exam, looking over the shoulder of the student next to you to learn what to do. But, but if they develop those technologies over a million years, then copying them here would save us a million years. It's worth it. And uh, in a couple of weeks, um, the Perseverance rover will land on Mars and search for life, most likely primitive life, but that should be very exciting if we find it. So I very much look forward to seeing what its instruments will find. The search goes on and um, it offers us new insights about our place in the universe. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. And um, we do have quite a few questions coming in. Um, 
so we'll get right to those. But if anyone else has questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, okay, so from Rhea, she asks, do you think intelligent life might have discovered a way to get to us, therefore traveling at the speed of light? Um, and is that physically possible for someone to do? 